lead us in a song. sword of strength when I am weak that takes me through when life is pressing me I have a sword of power from above I'm covered over by a shield of love. I claim the blood Jesus shed on Calvary. Those precious bloodstains were made there just for me through all my sin my sickness and my pain when I need healing I claim those precious blood stains I do not know how others make it through who never look to Calvary as I do for there the healing cleansing stream still flows with peace that only his redeemed can know i claim the blood jesus shed on calvary those precious blood stains were made there just for me through all my sin my sickness and my pain when i need healing i claim those precious blood stains through all my sin, my sickness and my pain. When I need healing, I claim those precious blood stand up here again and see y'all smiling faces. Let's all turn to John chapter 4, verse 27. The Gospel of John chapter 4, starting at verse 27. While you're doing that, you turn in your Bibles to John 4, 27. I'd like to ask, how many of y'all know somebody that likes to tell God what he needs to do? <laughs> I'm pretty sure every one of us has somebody just came to their mind. <laughs> that, that person that likes to tell God what he needs to be doing or what he should have already done. It's amazing to see that some, but we have that. And in our text here, we're going to see, we're going to jump right in where Jesus has just talked to the woman at the well, and the disciples are coming back to him. They've been gone gathering food. They're coming back to him to, to talk to him. And uh, somehow they, they think that it's, uh, it's time for them to tell him what he needs to do, like eat and other things. But uh, 
So we're going to be starting off there in John chapter 4 at verse 27. And it says, And upon this, meaning him talking to the lady at the well, Upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? They weren't brave enough to ask. 28 says, Then the woman, the woman left her water pot, pot and went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come and see a man which told me all things I ever did. Is this not the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. Verse 32, But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? And Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye that there are four months yet, and then cometh the harvest? But behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white, ready to harvest. Verse 36, And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is the saying true, one soweth, yet another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon you bestow no labor, and other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, He told me of that that I had ever done, that I ever did. <laughs> so when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days, and many more believed because of his own word. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to look into your word. Lord, we ask humbly that you use your living word to impact our lives where each one of us are right now. Father, I pray that you would remove the things you don't want said here in the room, and that you would add what you desire to be said through your spirit. I ask, Lord, that you receive the honor and glory, and I thank you for the opportunity. I ask in these things in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so the first rattle out of the box, we have these re disciples returning. Now, I'm going to have to talk fast today, okay? We've got 32 pages. No, I'm joking. But I am going to talk fast because I, I don't like slowing down. But sure enough, the first thing that happens, the disciples are returning back, and they saw what Jesus had, uh, was doing, and they began to judge. Well, why is he talking to her? Well, why is he talking to her? They want to know why Jesus is talking to an unclean woman, but they aren't brave enough to ask. This unclean woman of Samaria was just been impacted by their Lord, and they were wondering why. Didn't even notice the impact that she had from Jesus when she talked to him, but they wondered why he's talking to her. She was so impacted by our Lord that she left her water pot, water pot and went on mission. Y'all got to, I can't get my mouth going right tonight, so Donna's saying, slow down, so I'll try that. But sure enough, she was so impacted by our Lord, she left her water pot and went on mission. Just dropped everything she's doing and off she goes. Disciples didn't notice that either. The disciples were so steeped in the limitations of judgment that they didn't even notice. They haven't yet learned what Jesus' food is. Now, we all know what a Jesus slap is, don't we? We, we know when we're wrong and the Lord kind of says something through our pastor or our teacher or one of our, maybe our spouse, that we're doing wrong. Well, I call that a Jesus slap. And uh, so this here is Jesus' food we're looking at tonight. And uh, they were so steeped in the limitations of their judgment of this lady from this Samaritan woman that they didn't even notice that Jesus had been fed by talking to her. The woman at the well seems to already know the importance of sharing Jesus and why he is there. Did you notice that? That the disciples still haven't figured out his purpose and what he's doing there. He's having to tell them what his meat is and what fills him up and what his purpose is. But yet she knew because the moment she found out, she dropped her water pot and went to tell everybody in town. And so she already knows his purpose. However, the disciples are judging and trying to get him to eat food. Is it possible that we are so focused on the forest that we don't see the trees? The woman at the well seems to know that the harvest is ready before the disciples saw it. As we watch the news unfold in the war in Ukraine, I've noticed the dedication and zeal of the Ukrainian people, people of Ukraine, however you say that. I've noticed they've got some dedication and some stick to itiveness, and they've got some zeal. And, and they're doing well for those that aren't equipped like the Russians are. But I thought to myself as I looked at that in today's day and time, these events, shouldn't we fight for our faith and the lives of those that don't know Jesus Christ with that type of fervor? 
the type of fervor that they have to defend their country, to defend their people, shouldn't us as Christians have that type of fervor and zeal and, and fire to talk about our Savior, Jesus Christ? With the boldness and determination that the Ukrainian fighters have, are we willing to do that, to fight for their freedom and fight for the freedom of others? Are we willing to fight for the freedom of those that do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior with that type of dedication? In Mark 5.35, it tells us, and in following, it says, Jesus put the scoffers out of the area when he healed the ruler of the synagogue's daughter. If you read into that text, we don't have time tonight, Mark chapter 5, verse 35, he, he uh, once touched his garment, been healed. Things have happened, but he ends up getting, um, getting approached by the leader of the synagogue, and he wants him to heal his daughter. And when he goes to do that, he, he comes, and, and they actually started laughing and scoffing at him. And so he put them out. He took mom and daddy, and they went into the daughter. But how many people in our lives are scoffing and laughing that we put up with, that we love them through that, but they need to be put out? How many times do we deal with that? I think that it's time for us to be strong enough to know in our heart and in our soul what God wants us to do. If somebody's laughing and scoffing at you about doing some of God's work, they need to go away. <laughs> but we need to be loving when we do this. But Jesus did it, and it accomplished the goal at hand, and it took care of that. So how do we do that? How do we work into that? And uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. Are there some hard-hearted scoffers in our life that we need to stand firm with? lovingly stand firm with. I had a close friend and a co-worker living next door to me that I watched and I checked in on him and made sure that after each work, uh, okay, we're going to do this without getting upset, but after each work day, I made sure he was out of the woods and then he made it home safely. And I determined if he's going to be able to come back to work the next day. And when checking on him, I found him Friday, gone home to be with the Lord. And, and so Terry Roark at the camp is no longer here with me. But I realized that I had spent the last six or eight years living next door to him, watching him. He, he didn't talk to a lot of people. He was a very, um, a very quiet fella. He, he, was actually a, a, uh, he was actually a professor in college and taught on things, but he gave up his career in college and professor, and professor of college and, uh, because it didn't agree with his faith and his heart. They were preaching evolution and teaching it he wouldn't want to do that so he quit he'd been volunteering at spring lake for about eight years now and uh, terry was a smart man but he was a quiet man but i got to realizing after all these years of watching terry and talking with him he was uh he was one of them guys that was focused on the end times i tell you he was very focused on Jesus' return and I, I would tease that i think he was racing to see if jesus came back before he went to meet him because he didn't want to, he had a big thing of cancer on his face and he didn't want to have it fixed he said, the Lord is coming back. I don't need to go to a doctor. And um, ironically enough, about six months ago, me and a, another loving brother just sat him down, and I said, listen, you may think you're right. I said, but the bottom line is I'm going to be the one to find you. You need to go to the doctor and get that fixed. Quit thinking about yourself. Quit thinking you know when the Lord's coming back because my Bible tells me you don't. And go to the doctor. And then Ken Wheatley, another man that he respected in Hot Springs, said the same. So he began going to the doctor. He got it way down. It wasn't out anymore. He was, he was on the road to healing, but it was an issue forever. And, and so that's what happened. But my point is, the focus that I've had all these years on Terry Roark was a physical focus. I looked at him to make sure that he was going to be at work. I looked at him to make sure he wasn't laying out in the woods somewhere, hurt himself in a chainsaw. He came in that evening. I checked on him regularly, and, and uh, Don and I, we'd invite him to Thanksgiving every year. And, uh, but sure enough, I, I focused on the physical of Terry. I knew where he was going. He knows the Lord more than a lot of people I know. And uh, he's, as, I, as I've looked into and tried to help him, he didn't spend a penny on himself. He was a minimalist, and there was nothing in his house but a piano and the bed. And that's basically it. The man didn't have it. He had one fork, two spoons, and one knife. And that's all he had. But every penny he had, he gave to the Voice of the Martyrs, Ukrainian uh, house uh, for abused women in Ukraine, um, different ministries. Every bit of his money was given to a ministry of some sort. He lived at Spring Lake Free, but he did not take a penny to get paid. So this man's life was so close to God, I had no question as to where he was with the Lord. 
And, but my focus on the physical well-being of a person is not the proper focus. What I realized in his absence was I walk out the house and I look over there. Oh, man, my buddy's not there. Where is he? Oh, yeah. And, but I realized that I was so focused on the physical well-being, I should be partying and celebrating right now. This man's in heaven. And I know he's in heaven because he was ready to go a long time ago. And uh, I should really be happy about that. But, but a lot of times we have people like me and others that, that seem to think we know what God wants and what he should do. In reality, we're wrong. And God knows. You know, there was a story in Numbers 20, 10, where Moses struck a rock. He was supposed to speak to the rock to get water to come out. And he got mad and he hit it. And God says, you're not going to see promised land as a result of that. And, and so we see where mankind has this natural want to do what we think is right. And, and we pay for it on and over and over again. Uh, I think the world has enough dictators. And, uh, and I truly believe that when you have more than one boss, you have no boss. There's only one boss. That's God. Anybody else thinks they're taking that place, that, that's chaotic and we have no boss. God's boss. And that's the way I see it. The world has enough dictators and bosses already. Never underestimate the hand of God. He's got things handled, and the power that he has in his hand is much greater than anything else we know. Our challenge is to be so focused on Jesus and his kingdom that we get to witness the hand of God at work in our lives and at work in the lives of the other people. During one of our staff morning prayers last week, I remember thanking God. Is he not here? Yeah, he's not here. I can talk about him. I remember thanking God for Tom Wolfe. And, and we got up from the prayer, and I was like, I, I, I don't really understand why I just said that in a prayer, guys. I haven't talked to Tom in a long time now. I'm not really sure why I just thank God for him and his help with this new dorm, but I did. The very next day, Tom Wolf drove up in his truck up to the dorm we're building, pulled up beside that, and I looked down, I got off the roof. Oh, no, Daryl, don't get down. I said, no, Tom, I got to come talk to you. I got to tell you that I thank God for you yesterday before you showed up today. And that's odd. <laughs> and I said, but there's no coincidence. So Tom immediately went to work in how he could figure out to get a group of men out there on a Saturday and help us finish that dorm, which is desperately needed because it needs to be working on May 30th. And not a minute after, <laughs> we've got kids coming. So, But sure enough, this is the power of God working behind the scenes, and we don't even have the ability to contemplate or to foresee what's happening. All I know is when I pray, I say what God's Spirit is leading me to say. And I said, thank you, Lord, for Tom Wolf." And the next day, the man showed up. And that's the way we need to live. It would be very easy to get kind of off kilter with today's news and everything. But I do believe that if we have complete faith in what God can do in his power and his hand, that all of this war and rush and all these other things going on will be put into their place. And we'll find the most important thing is where are people going for eternity? Who do they have as their Savior if they have one at all? Do they know about Jesus Christ? Have we talked to them about the love of the Lord and the forgiveness that's offered through Jesus Christ? That's the proper focus. God has things handled, and if you think that we can't go and do that, it's as simple as just talking one of these things right here, and you open it up, and it tells you right there on the back page what they need to read to come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's how simple sharing our faith is. Put the little Bible in your pocket. When the Lord says talk to somebody, pull it out, show them that, give it to them, and walk away if that's all you can do. Never underestimate the power of God. How many of us love to receive gifts in the mail? I do. They, they buy a lot of stuff at the camp there, you know, things for office work and stuff. And I see all these boxes coming in. I say, Is it mine? It ain't got my name on it. It ain't mine. I really like to get gifts. I don't know why. Even if I know they're coming, I kind of like to get them. You wait around on them and everything. God has a free gift of ministry and service to him waiting on each one of us. That gift is there for us. All we have to do is receive it. We have a little book here. It's the Spring Lake Camping Retreat Annual Report. They're out there on the table. I'd encourage each of you to take a look at that and see what God's doing. I could read just a little bit of it. It's nine weeks of summer camp, 25 weekend retreats, and four church picnics, and there were 3,091 campers, 406 salvations, and nine called to ministry. You have an opportunity to do a Tom Wolf thing and be involved in 406 salvations in one season and nine called to ministry. Now get to thinking how many that those called to ministry will impact with their life. This is the opportunity. This is a boxed up gift that has been set for us that God has waiting. And I love to get me some gifts. And so why aren't we doing that? How do we do that? 
There's a Stan Jones Memorial Fund that's been put together at Spring Lake that I can explain to you in detail if we have time afterwards. And this fund is one of our pastors and leader of the camp uh, passed away, and we created him and his association, South Arkansas, created a fund that helps kids come to camp. So different people can give to this fund to make sure those that don't have money can come to camp. And so that's the Stan Jones Memorial Fund. And if you need to know more about that, ask me. What can be learned about our current events in our world today? What educated guesses, hypotheses, or conclusions can we draw from the way things are in this world right now? What kind of things, what kind of conclusions do you draw in your mind about watching the news? Hearing the things Brother Mike shared with us and the things we know are going on in this world, um, I see a lot. And uh, if I didn't have the faith I have, it, it would inundate me. It would, it would crush me what I see going wrong in this world. But we also have this time of year where nature is waking up. We're looking at the plum trees and the dogwoods, and we're looking at all the, the jonquils or daisies or whatever they are, all the blooming, all the new life that you see coming up right now is something to focus on too. Yes, we have some hard stuff going on in this world, but we also have new life sprouting up everywhere around us. So what do we see from that? What should we take away from the urgency of current events of the world and the new lives that only God can cause to happen. How does that relate to our everyday life and service to God? How does the fact that there's a, a white harvest out there for us to go to, it's a gift that God has given us, and it's ripe for picking right now, how does that impact our daily lives? Do we wake up every day and put our effort towards that harvest? Put our effort towards how we can see how God is moving in the lives of other people, in our life too. You wouldn't believe what I went through to get this ready. It's, it's, it happened, my wife, Donna's shaking her head right now, because it happens, and, and, and I, I jokingly say, well, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm preaching anymore, because these were two weeks beforehand, it was rough. I mean, it, you know, finding Terry is tough, but there's been a whole lot more, and up until this last minute, the computer wouldn't print, and I believe that electronics are Satan's way into this world. I'm just saying that I think computers and all this stuff is... It, Brother Mike, do you have this problem when you're trying to type something out in a hurry? Yeah, I'm telling you. But anyway, these, these challenges come. But how does this relate to my everyday life? Well, I know I have the challenges because we've learned in the men's Bible study in the past that you got a target on your back. You take in this lifestyle. You take in this ministry. You just put your big old target on your back for Satan to throw things at. So I understand these things, and I try to make it to them as fast as I can and as, as strong as I can. Revelation 1, 5 through 6 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, witness and the first begot, begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests unto God his Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Did you catch that? We're priests. I, I could have done a study about all the times we're called priests and ministers and servants of God, but it's not necessary. We know that. And so how come we don't act like priests and ministers? Why, why aren't we living when, when I was just, you know, okay, I got to tell you all, it's just as much to me as anybody else. All this right here God said to me to fix it in my life before I come told you, okay? So I am not looking down on anybody. God told me that I need to work on these things. I'm just sharing it. Some of the reasons we don't share Christ like we should are judgment and lack of forgiveness. I, I heard a, a sermon a while back. Of, I can't remember the fellow's name. He's an a Irish fellow, and he caught my ear. And he was talking about the, the biggest problem we have is judgment, that, that we see people coming at us, and we begin to judge them, just like the disciples did the lady at the well, begin to judge them. You know, she, she's unclean. Why is our Lord talking to her? What's, what's going on here? We have that natural inclination to do that and and we we definitely could do that to everybody we see the one in the mirror too we could judge ourselves pretty hard but the reality of it is that Jesus doesn't want us to judge mainly because he forgave us each morning I jump out that bed and I'm expecting my savior has washed me clean and has forgiven me and I'm going to begin that day in prayer with him and I'm counting on Jesus to forgive me and use me that day. So how come I can't do that with my brothers and sisters in this world? That's what we have to do. We're challenged to love one another as he has loved us. He loved me in a bad way, a good, good, good way, I should say. 
So I'm having to be challenged to love my brothers and sisters like that now. But we, we look at ourselves. We say we can't do that. We can't talk. We can't get up in front of people. We're not, we're not worthy. And our computer makes us mad. But we, <laughs> but we literally have the ability. We have been called priests for a reason. We have been called children of God for a reason. And that reason is to share what we know. We depend on our Lord to forgive us daily and fresh and anew. And we need to do that with everywhere else. However, when it comes to relating with other people, we don't behave that way. We want to add up the past knowledge we have of them and the history and the experience we've had with that person and make a judgment and not forgive them. Yet we depend on our Lord's forgiveness every day, fresh and new. Uh, I'm analytical. That's how the Lord allows people like me and Brother Bryce to fix things. Okay, I tried this, didn't work, tried that. Well, it must be out of gas. But anyway, we, <laughs> we, we try different things. We add to that to fix what the Lord allows us to fix. So with people, we naturally have an inclination. Well, I tell you, man, we visited her six times. She ain't going to want to hear about the Lord. You know, last time I pulled up in there, she sicked a dog on me. So I'm going to learn not to do that again, you know. But what I've told everybody I've ever served with is that um, you can fix just about anything. If you can't figure out what's wrong, call the person that made it. He knows how to fix it, and he can give you the parts or another machine or whatever. That works with everything but people. What you got to do is call the man that made it, made the people, and you get in with God, and he'll help you with that. But there are times when we need to stand firm. If we have somebody working against God's direction, you got to stand firm in love and stop that. And that can be very hard. We, we've had some issues with that over the years in all the different ministries. And uh, it's very hard to be firm and loving. Very, very hard. People that aren't on the right path anyway will take it wrong and they'll disappear. Sometimes they need to disappear until the Lord gets a hold of them again. But we've had some of that. And I, I, my challenge is to not constantly remember the past and add up like I do fixing a mechanical thing. I need to remember that I've got the Jesus factor to figure in. That, yes, that person right there may have been a horrible person and may have had five husbands and the one she's with now she ain't even married to. And they live in Samaria where we don't talk to people. And Jesus has to tell you, I must needs go through there or you're going to go around me. It may be that bad. But what we have to do is realize that Jesus' factor is he may have turned that life completely around. And if my brother or somebody comes to me and I assume that they are just like they were before, I've limited Jesus. Never limit what Jesus and God can do. Because I know what I was at the age of 23 and what I was at the age of 25. I know, what, well, I couldn't read at all. And so I, that was a right away thing. But I've seen what God can do with me, so why don't I see what God can do with other people too? Oftentimes people look for something to do and long for a purpose in life. Have you ever noticed that? A lot of guys, young men especially, we run around and, man, I ain't got no purpose in life. I don't know what I'm going to do to serve the Lord. I just wish there was some. Do you realize there are more ways to serve our Lord and Savior than we can possibly list? There are a lot of ways to serve him. So we know that we are being transformed into the likeness of Christ. What was your last transformation? It, it says in that word, actually, that we are, oh, here it is. Romans 12, 2 says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. If you translate that other, it says, be you being transformed. Not transformed once, but constantly transformed into the likeness of God. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How was I changed last? How was I transformed last? What did I do most recently to let Jesus change my life in a way that he can use me more? That's the question for each one of us to answer. Not just tonight, but every morning. What have I done? One of the neatest things, I think you all all know that, but every morning I wake up, I ask God, bless me indeed, and enlarge my territory for him, and have his hand to be with me, and to keep evil far from me. But I say it in different words. I don't, I don't like repeating the same thing to my Lord. If I talked to Donna and said the same thing over and over again, she'd get bored. So when I talk to my Lord, I don't say the same thing over and over again. But I do ask that very same purpose. Lord, give me your blessings. I'm going to leave it up to you. I don't need a Cadillac, but if you could give me some more ministry and more gifts and talents to serve you, I'd love that blessing. And enlarge my territory and my coast that I'm allowed to work within to serve you. Give me more, Lord, but it needs to be your decision, not what I want. And I tell you, I would really like a 1953 Chevy pickup, but I don't ask God for that. I would like a 1969 Chevrolet Camaro, too, but I don't ask God for that. I, what I ask God for is what he wants. 
And, and it's a challenge because each time he gives me something, there's something else that I am not capable of overcoming. There'll be something in that challenge, in that ministry that I can't do alone, that I've got to lean on God to do it for me. Is it? I pray for Brother Gary because I was a Sunday school director for 10 or 11 years one time. Oh, my goodness. That's a challenge. <laughs> and, uh, and you don't realize it, but there are opportunities for us to just pray for those leaders in ministry. And if you jump into another type of service for the Lord, he's going to stretch you a little bit. I tell you, if you think you're going to control these thermostats, that's a bigger challenge than you realize. Because this one's hot and that's cold. Now this one's cold and that's hot. And, and the preacher really wants an arm. <laughs> and so you, anything you take on for the Lord is going to be a challenge. How do, we do, how do we deal with that? In loving kindness, starting off fresh and anew every day. And be ready for this. When you do that, you're going to feel like you've been walked on. Satan, that old black dog on this shoulder, he's telling you all along, man, you have forgiven them 20 times and they continue to do that. Ignore the black dog. Feed the white one. Just tell the Lord, I'm doing what you want me to do. When you want me to change, let me know and I'll change it. And that's how you do that. But there will be something you can't handle alone, and it will be rather hard for you to see and to know what the Lord wants without asking him. How were we last changed to be more like Christ? How are you planning to share Jesus Christ better than you did before? Or better yet, how are you planning on sharing Jesus Christ with the next person you see when you leave here tonight? How are you planning on sharing Christ and sharing your faith in Jesus Christ, the one who has given you the love and the desire and the hunger to be here right now. How are you going to tell somebody about that when you leave here tonight? Ask the Lord to tell you. It's, I'm not able to go out and just jump into conversion conversations and talk about my Lord. God has to open that door. And then he gives me the opportunity to say something. And if, if this dummy can do it, y'all can do it, okay? If it can come out of this thing, it can come out of y'all, I promise you. We're challenged to learn from the past mistakes in history so we don't repeat the same actions. We grow and then we learn, and that applies to everything, like I said, but people. So the challenge is now for us to learn from the past without judging people and their past. How can we factor in the Jesus factor and radically share Jesus Christ? How can we do that? It, to me, it, it's, it's when I notice myself judging, I stop it immediately. And I have the benefit of family members that can help me with that. If you see me talking bad about them, tell me, hey, you're judging again. Because what judging does is stops the love, okay? Just like a anger or sin stops the connection with God through his spirit. You don't get to hear much from God if you're in the middle of sin, okay? But this, these things can alter what you're doing. And how can we avoid that? Well, it's as simple. Just remember when you start to judge, stop. Because that is stopping your love for that person. Love them through that. Love them enough to go ahead and stop that. And love is the answer. John 13, 34 and 35 says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Because hey, we got this group of people coming back with a bunch of food for our Lord. But they're trying to figure out how they are his disciples because they're wanting to know why he's talking to that unclean woman. He ain't got no love in him. And, and so these things are very, very easy to squelch if we're judging, if we judge people. And, but that's what I do. That's my personality, and that's how I fix things. And, and so it's very easy for me to slip into that. It's a challenge because we forgive and forget with the same situations like animals, and we're going to be <laughs> in a bad way. They say they're going to let the dog bite you next time. Trust me, if you don't learn from that past experience, you're going to get bit by a dog. And so we need to learn from our past in the area, in certain areas. But let love go through that and let, let the Lord work through you. Have people, oh, we have people in this world that are called preppers. And they're really getting prevalent now. But preppers, they're prepared for the end of the world. They're prepared for our economy to collapse. They're prepared for there not to be any food. They're prepared for a nuclear bomb. I'm a prepper for Jesus, okay? I am not worried about a nuclear bomb. It can't do anything to me that my Lord won't do to me standing in front of him when I see him next, okay? I am not afraid of COVID or something like that. I am more feared of what my Savior may think of me when I don't worship and I don't love him and love his creation. That's more important to me. I'm not worried about our economy collapsing. I am not worried about the mark of the beast. You know why? I know how to shoot deer and cook them. 
I don't need a mark of the beast to buy my food, okay? I know how to fish. I cook that too. I don't need their electricity or their gas. I'll do it with wood. I'm a prepper. I am prepared for Jesus Christ to return at any moment, and I want to serve him better and more every day. And if something else happens on this world while I'm still here, he's got it figured out. I never underestimate the power of God. And so I'm a prepper, but I'm preparing for Jesus to return. And that's what Brother Terry did. He, he always said that he, the Lord will be back before he needs to go to the doctor or anything. He, he was a definite prepper for the Lord's return. So I tell you that end times, when the end times come, we're given the choice of receiving the mark of the beast. If we're not buying food or doing the, the merchant thing, there will be a way around it. God will take care of that if we're still here. And we ain't going to get into it. We've got a revelation study going on. We can go really far with this dispensationalist and pre all this stuff. We don't want to do that. What's most important is our relationship with the Lord. Don't get to wondering if the, if the rapture's already happened or if we're in tribulation or if we're not or if we're going to do this. Day. Don't worry about that. You get right with God, all that's took care of. Keep yourself in the Lord's will, and that will be taken care of. I do believe Christians should be preppers, but it's preppers for their, their Lord to return. God tells us to encourage one another even more as we see this day approaching. So as I see these things happening, my job, my assignment is to encourage people. And, and it ain't going to be no worse on this earth than it will be when we see our Savior. That, that I know for sure because I wouldn't be alive today without him. So what can happen to me in this life is nothing compared to that. God's word tells us to encourage him. I believe the Christians should not fear and be afraid of scare and scared and prepping for what's going to happen in the world and for some economic reason, but they should be focused on what the Lord is doing. As Christians, we need to be more afraid of the fact that our Lord may return at any moment and we may not have been doing what he told us to do. Matthew 25, 14 through 30 says... For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods and said one to the other. He gave, well, he said to one, he gave five talents to the another two, to another one, to every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey. Then he had received, uh, then he had received five talents. Then he that had received five talents went and traded it with the same and made them another five talents. And likewise, he that received two, he also gained another two. But he that received one digged it in the earth and hid the Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoned with them. And he had received the ones that had five talents came, brought him five talents, saying, Lord, I delivered this unto me. You delivered unto me five talents, and behold, I've gained five. Let's cut through that. We know what it is. The one that had one talent buried it. And there's no coincidence that it's called talent, okay? Do we have talents, gifts and talents and skills that we are burying for God? Because it's coming back. Jesus is coming back. He's given me the ability to read for a reason. And it's not to read comic books. It's to read the word of God. And he's coming back. If he's only given me one talent, if I bury that and don't use it, He's going to take that and give it to somebody else and send me. You know what it says at the end? And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's what happens to the unprofitable servant. What are we? Are we being profitable? Are we using that one talent he gave us? And You know, mine isn't a great talent, but, but you know, plumbing is something. <laughs> are we using whatever we have for the Lord? Isn't it? worth more to do that and not fear the Lord. Everybody seems to be feared about world events right now. It's really something. Our decisions from our government and everybody are made by fear right now. And very few of us are on the offense. We're all on the defense right now. And and I, I am more worried about what my Lord's going to say when he comes back than any of these things that our, our government and everybody else is trying to fix for us. All right, so isn't it worth more to focus on Jesus than the world events? And we have this opportunity, and uh, God's mercy frees us to serve. Okay, so we have a habit of limiting other people and how they could serve the Lord. We also have that habit with ourselves of telling ourselves we can't serve the Lord. Um, I had a brother Brent told me at camp the other day, uh, it's been a month or so ago, I said something about I get so nervous trying to play the guitar, and I, I just 
just I keep messed up and I'm really not good at it. And he looked me dead in the eye and said, Daryl, the only limitation you have is yourself. And uh, he's pretty good at putting me in a place like that. But sure enough, he's right. The only limitation I've ever run upon in my life is the thing that I didn't step out and let God do. And I'm a two-foot feller. When I step into something, I jump both feet right off in there and then let the Lord save me. And I've got to see him do that a lot with me, but also with other people. Now, I've mentioned all of these different ways we can serve the Lord. We have, there's uh, multiple ministries that you can use your talents in. Spring Lake Camp is one of them. Right now, we're in the middle of building another 64-bed dorm. And one guy up there, okay? Jonathan has his job. He's got a lot to do there. He's a new employee. He's got a lot on him right now. Brother Brent has, too. So there's one guy up there trying to build a bed, a dorm with 64 beds in it. And the Lord will take care of that. I have no doubt that in eight weeks, he will have that dorm completed, and, and it ain't going to be from me. It won't be by me. But this is an opportunity to serve him just in that. Uh, we need people in the kitchen on a regular basis to do the dishes, to help us cook, and to serve people. Uh, disaster relief. Right now, disaster relief is sending groups of, every week they send another group over, group over to Ukraine and Poland in that area. And you stay for two weeks, and then you come back. But every week there's a new group coming and one coming back. It rotates in and out. Disaster relief. You do not have to be credentialed to go to that. You don't have to have all the things that's necessary to be involved in disaster relief. If you want to go help, you let them know at the Baptist Convention, you can go help. Um, Traveler's Chapel, out on the highway. Have you ever put yourself in the shoes of a traveler or a truck driver and thought, okay, I'm, I'm out on the road driving, all of a sudden COVID just hit my house. Not my town, but hit my house. My wife and my children have COVID, and I am six hours away from my truck, and there's nowhere to go. You can stop on your side of the truck, get a ticket, and park in there and pray for your family. But Traveler's Chapel is set there at JJ's truck stop for a reason. It catches the weary traveler that is out and that needs to talk to the Lord in a very, very urgent way. And so you have the Traveler's Chapel. The steeple has blown off of that thing. There's a handicap ramp that has a hole in it, and I could go on. There's ways you can serve the Lord at the Traveler's Chapel. Mission Impossible is that group I talked about. We get to go to a different Christian camp every year. We get to do some work remodeling, building buildings for one week out of every year. Send Relief is another one. A family Farm is another one. You go out there and ask Brother Stan May if there's something you can do, I promise you he got something ready for you to do. And it's not going to be hard. And those gifts and talents that we're trying to bury, he's gonna, God's going to use them right there at Family Farm. Okay? There's a way that we can serve him if we just pursued those things. If I <laughs> pursued ministry the way I pursued looking at a 1953 Chevy pickup or a 1969 Chevy Camaro, I know those names because that's what I want. I will actually start to salivate and drool when I see a pretty one. If I followed my Lord's ministry like that, just imagine what God could do. If each one of us followed the Lord the way we follow our desires and our wants and, and what we can see him do, just imagine what he could do in this world. So we got to cut to the end here. we got one minute left, so we're going to make this fast. We didn't have 32 pages. There was only 31. Where do you stand with Jesus right now? In conclusion, you yourself, where do you stand with the Lord? Now, I think it's stepping on people's toes for me to come and tell you, Brother Tony, you need to be sharing Christ. No, God does that, okay? Just like when the Lord let down that, that uh, sheet full of uh, food to, to Peter, explained to him that, you know, there's, there's plain food. There's not, but I made this clean, and you're not going to question my food, Peter. That's God's job, to tell people what they can eat. It's God's job to tell people what ministry to be into. And so I won't tell you ex every kind of ministry you should be in, but where do you stand with Jesus right now? Ask him. Ask him to tell you plain and simple. And that's the way he works with me. It has to be pretty obvious. Does he live in you? Do you even know the Lord Jesus as your Savior? Are these things that I'm saying seem kind of great to you? Why would you dedicate your life to somebody like Jesus? Does that seem great to you? Well, is he living in you? That's the first thing. That's the most important thing. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you have an ongoing relationship with him? I know where Donna's at at all times. I know where my Lord is at all times, too. You know where your children are at all times, don't you? Grandchildren, too. But do we know where we stand with our Lord at every waking moment of our life? Have you made that mark yet? I'm not that good. I'm aiming there, but I'm not that good. You can still see the needs. Can you still see the needs of people? If you judge a whole lot, you stop seeing their needs. Can you see the needs of people? God has given us an opportunity to remove lukewarmth. Don't even have to add to that. 
How many souls have we impacted lately? Jesus impacted the soul of that Samaritan woman at that jail. How many at that well? How many people have we impacted in our life in this last week, in this last month, in this last hour? How many people have we impacted with the Jesus Christ? Now it's the time to make those things right and see how well we're doing on judgment, forgiveness, and love, and sharing Christ. The judgment will stop it. The forgiveness, if you don't have it, it will stop your ability to share Christ. So where do we stand on that? Where are we at personally? And how can y'all pray for Brother Mike, Brother Tony, Brother Robert, all those that have, have taken this step and throws them into that battle? How are we praying for them and encouraging them and supporting them in that? How are we doing that? And how are we forgiving people, realizing that the next time I may see Brother Tony, Jesus has completely forgotten him, and now he's a decent guy. I mean, how can I be prepared for that? I didn't get the joke. Without Brother Johnny here, I have nobody to pick on, okay? So I got I to get never sit at the front when I'm preaching, okay, because I'm going to get you. Anyway, I wanted to share that with y'all. Thank y'all for listening. And Brother Tony's going to come up now, and we're going to have a, 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 a song of invitation. And come on up, Brother. And as we do that, I want y'all to prayerfully consider just exactly where you stand with Jesus. And then, if you're good with Jesus, prayerfully consider your pastors and the ministers that have dedicated their life to serving our God. Okay? Let's go ahead. Brother Tony, you're going to lead us.